Welcome to Expedition Self on Ohm Times Radio with lifelong learner, entrepreneur, and creator of the worlds of Expedition Self, Sam Parado. Sam shares four decades of studying, guiding, and teaching how to go inside so we can build an incredibly powerful, dynamic, and validating relationship with the self. Expedition Self is laced with stellar, unexpected insights about what it means to be human. Listen now and ignite your self-development process with Sam Parado. Well, hello and welcome to Expedition Self. I'm Sam Parado and you are here with uh, me tonight and actually it's going to be an us tonight um, because like I mentioned a few sessions ago, we are uh, inviting people to talk about their growth work. Uh, in kind of casual way, like the like what it really means for them. And tonight I get to have my second guest uh, along this. And I decided to call it Chat GCT. And I don't know if any of you are hearing about Chat GPT, but I thought, oh, I'll just do a play on these words. But it's basically a conversation about transformation and consciousness. And I don't remember what the G is. Growth. Oh, <laughs> it's growth work. Well, there you go. So uh, tonight's guest, I just want to tell you a little bit about her, and then we'll invite her to come on and talk with us. Um, I met Stephanie a few years ago when I was trying to learn about online courses and how to market them and what it was all about. And boy, is she a powerhouse. And um, there is, I always feel like when I'm with Stephanie, that the life force that pumps through her body every minute of every day is palpable. And of course, you know, getting to meet uh, someone who takes life on like that has been a really special treat for me. So anyway, we're lucky enough to have Stephanie come on today and talk about growth work, my favorite subject. So welcome, Stephanie. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that intro. I'll have to try to live up to it. You always have such a wonderful things to say about me. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You don't have to live up to it at all because you live in it every day. You live into life every day and as far as I'm concerned. Oh, well, thank you. You are welcome. I don't mean to portray you as someone who never gets tired or you know, doesn't have slumps, but really I just feel like you you grab a hold of what life is supposed to be and you just more, you know, work it for everything that it is, it can be. So, you know, I, I think I do have that tenacious take life on kind of thing inside of me. You've helped me identify that and work with that. And I guess that's what we're going to chat about. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I know a little bit, you know, I'm going to just say this to the audience. I, I know there's going to come a point where I might have guests on that I don't know as well. Um, but it is really cool that I do know a little bit more because uh, one of the things I would just like you to start out a little bit is talking about you going to school and all the things that you studied, but particularly being a pastry chef. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you can put it in the context of what you actually do for a living too and talk about it. But I just think, I love this, this whole idea that you studied these extra things. So would you mind sharing just a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I, uh, well, I went to undergrad and completed my undergraduate studies. I actually, I did uh, have a BA in sociology and then I almost triple majored, but I didn't uh, do the last couple of credits that you needed for then uh, religion and uh, Spanish, actually, in my undergrad. And uh, my whole life, food has been this way to love people and share. And, you know, my family uh, owned a restaurant when I was young, and we always had home-cooked meals. And uh, this idea of making gorgeous cakes and desserts really hit me when I was in high school. And it was very interesting to me, um, but I knew, you know, like we grow up and we go to college and that's what you do after high school. And so I did that and I was always a very curious learner. I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, <laughs> so after undergrad, I had almost this crossroads where um, a lot of my sociology professors, you know, some of them were like, oh, you should go into graduate studies for social work or, you know, oh, so one of them actually was like, well, you should consider the FBI and, um, <laughs> oh my God. the yeah. FBI, oh my gosh, you would have been so good in that uh, in yeah. the investigation work. 
<laughs> so I thought, you know, it was, I don't know if I told this to you, but um, with that, you know, it was intriguing to me, but I was in love with my now husband and I was just like, you know, I don't know if we could keep the secrets and put danger in our lives. So I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> you know, I didn't pursue the FBI. Um, or did I? Dun, dun, dun. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, um, so I went to culinary school. This, this idea of culinary school uh, came into my head, and I, I looked into it, and I got a scholarship. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to do it now, then I never will. And um, so we went. And I, I, I went to, I say we, because I was talking about my husband. He also came with me. Um, he didn't go to culinary school, but he came with me to where it was. And yeah, I went into baking and pastry. And so I have a diploma in baking and pastry arts. I went into uh, chefing and restauranting and uh, all the stuff that comes with it. I've, I've made wedding cakes and, and now I do something completely different. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I, I went and studied that because, you know, why not? Yeah, well, there it is. Study that. Why not? And of course, we... So I think so often, right, people get locked into this idea that they're supposed to do this one thing or they're supposed to stay on this one track instead of really listening to their bellies, tell them, oh, no, I'm intrigued by this or I'm interested in this. I'm going to go explore it. Like, I think the old traditional viewpoint of life was, you know, build through five steps and then you succeed. And then that's what a good life is. And when I listen to you talk about your life, a lot of times I think, wow, that's the idea, right? Is that you sample and experiment and experience a bunch of different things and it makes you more interesting and more dimensional. And of course, you have more to make connection with inside because I think metaphor, right, with growth work is so important that the more you explore these kinds of things, you also have that to bring to your growth work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I value I value curiosity for sure. I, you know, I grew up in a family where, you know, even my grandparents, as they became great grandparents, still didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up. You know, this whole, you know, with air quotes when they grew up, um, because obviously they were well into their lives. But um, I think just the idea of having curiosity and intrigue in what you're doing is a vital part of life. And so I, you know, in, in talk to you, I don't walk around thinking I'm the most curious, intriguing person. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think about that. You know, we have these conversations and I think, oh, yeah, I've done quite a few things. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. Well, I want to just mention this about one of the elements that I think is important about growth work. Um, is the way that curiosity translates to wanting to understand what's going on inside of the self. And a lot of times when I talk to people, you know, and they describe their, uh, you know, their self relationship, it's kind of like they're looking to get to a place where there's a conclusion about something. And oftentimes, of course, it has the right wrong thing attached to it. Where really, to me, it's all about utilizing what you're describing as this curiosity to go inside. And inside, and while you're using that, um, you're really experimenting and you're really testing things out. And of course, that makes you less likely to make it right and wrong or good and bad. So I'm curious, <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm curious about how um, you have noticed your own curiosity having something to do with trying to learn about yourself and understand yourself better and build a relationship with yourself. Mm. Well, I have to say, you, you, you mentioned that potentially this curiosity and openness uh, might make it less likely that I'm making things about right and wrong. And that's been such a big thing that I've had to struggle with, which is not the answer to your question, but it just it hit me, you know, like, oh, that's interesting, because um, I have had to overcome kind of thinking about wrong versus right. But um, this curiosity in terms of growth within myself, I don't know that until really I started, you know, working with your teachings and thinking about this whole exposition self journey. I don't know that I noticed that it was personal growth, like that that was what was happening, hmm. but it, it, it's more just, Hey, I want to know about that. You know, I never really looked back and thought, well, why do I want to know about that? Or what is that, you know, indicating about where I am with myself or curiosity um, about inner growth things, but if I, I look back at them, especially regarding food, right? If we look at what I said about it, which is that 
it's my way to love people. And here I was drawn, even after going through undergrad and, and, you know, um, graduating, I still had this strong desire to go towards why I wanted to make these masterpieces of cake, especially wedding cakes. I don't know why. It's just like, oh my gosh, so much like beauty and it's a, a momentous occasion for people. And it was like, this felt like this most epic of all desserts is to make a wedding cake for people's weddings. And I have had the honor of making a lot of my friends and family's wedding cakes. And it's just been so amazing to be able to provide that for their day and their love and like have it be this symbol of me nourishing that love and being part of that experience with them and let them have their day. Um, but yeah, that is really interesting. Even just that one part of my curiosity, how it would reflect on my own personal self growth journey and what I'm really seeking inside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, back. <laughs> uh, what did you say? I said a lot to unpack there. Just about wedding cake. <laughs> I know, actually, I found myself listening to you thinking, oh, wow, I don't think we've ever talked about that in that particular way and what mm-hmm. it actually symbolizes. See, if we look at our lives as though there's no accident, then we start to recognize. And of course, we haven't gotten to it, but you have this amazing garden, too, that you have on mm-hmm. your uh, property with your children and your family. And right. So the food, the love of food has has, has certainly not gone away in your world. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's very pervasive. I just made homemade bread today because we didn't make it. We usually do Sunday bread, but we didn't do it this past Sunday. So I, I made it today for dinner, and everyone was like, "Oh, it's bread!" So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely a huge part of our lives. One time, I was at a workshop, and the exercise was to have us eat a potato chip in a very mindful way. And I, I probably think lots of people who are listening have had some kind of this experience where you literally just completely become one with the, whatever the thing is you're eating. And mine was this salty potato chip. And, um, you know, what I noticed is that just the, to have the presence of mind, like to put your freshly made bread in, in your mouth, right. And really receive it and nourish yourself with it and appreciate that moment. I just think we miss that so, so, so often. And so we end up feeling I think a lot of times not nurtured and we don't have as much comfort as we need because we actually miss it even with the food that we eat. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like that's something you have a a real connection to in the way you talk about it. I do. I I have, I have a noticeable, um, I suppose mental and emotional shift when I do not have food that delights me for a long enough amount of time. I need flavor and I need time to appreciate it. I need texture and I need, you know, the sour and the sweet and the salty. And if I just have the same thing over and over and it's not complex enough or, you know, it it doesn't take much of a sauce on the same chicken and broccoli and potatoes that we've had, you know, every week, but I just put a little sauce on it. That's enough. So it's not like it needs to be this huge extravagant meal, but I can feel when I need to have a good meal and actually appreciate it and have it be intriguing to me. Hmm. So do you think we would be able to say that food is love? Oh, yes. I actually oh, yes. have a, a food <laughs> friend that my sister made at one of those, you paint ceramic places that says just that. It sits next to my oven and I use it. Oh, is that right? Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know where we were going to go, but it, it's a great place for us to start, which is this idea of food is love. So mm-hmm. um, if you go back to you know, like in your 20s, what did you think self-development meant, Stephanie? Like, how did you define it for yourself? Oh, man. Me in my 20s. Well, you could go back to being a teen, too. I mean, you know, any age is all right. I'm just like before now, (laughs) you know. Uh I was going to say early, like college age, self-growth was all about power and control. So oh. I, I be in control of everything and feel powerful and invincible um, and educated, you know, so I always had that individual, like I, I, I went to college to learn because I loved learning. I didn't go to college to become a career, you know, to get a career. Um, yeah. That's still really kind of how I tackle everything. Um, but it was all about that. And then 
when I got into a career and it was later twenties, it was really about, I would do a lot of what I'd probably would be more considered professional growth. What was, um, how, leading others. So it turns like external, even though it's always internal, right. But like feeling like I could impact other people instead of, I needed to be this powerhouse myself. It was like, okay, well, how can I empower other people? And so that's kind of where it turned then. But I, I think, um, I wasn't really in touch with what was going on inside in a very clear way. And, and I mean, I'm still working on it, but um, I've had lots of breakthroughs in the last few years since knowing you. And so I would mm-hmm. say my looking back at what I thought growth was then, I would say probably was really ignoring my own needs a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm actually appreciating because I think a lot of times that that is what happens, right? Is people mm-hmm. think that being high performing or m- accomplishing things is the growth, right? It's their personal growth. But what comes with it is actually what you just said, ignoring your own needs. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Now, or where or you... being overwhelmed with one of the needs that I shut down everything else, you know? Oh, that's interesting. So can you just yeah. say a little more about what that looks like when you say, because for, you know, I feel like people could uh, appreciate hearing a little bit more detail about that, like going into one need yeah. and then stuffing the others. Yeah, I think if, if I think of, you know, when I thought about myself back in college and thinking about like I needed to be this powerhouse and self-sufficient and all that, I think it really feels now looking back on it as my need was to feel Right. And so I spun up all this other stuff around me. And so that need to feel safe in some sort of way, I think, was really the overpowering need of mine. I needed to feel safe of my own volition. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I created now, all this. Stuff. And now, when you say safe, do you mean like emotionally safe or just the idea that you were less, uh, you weren't vulnerable? Like you, you, people couldn't get to you in a way that would harm you? Like, what did you mean there by that? I think invulnerable on all fronts, you know, um, emotionally safe was probably pervasive because I wasn't in a, any more dangerous scenario than just normal walking around. You know, there was not like real physical danger in any sort of tangible way. So, but I did have a fear. Like I was, I was a female alone on campus and I'm not tall. And so I did have like, I worked out because I wanted to be able to put up a fight if I needed to, you know, there was no reason for me to believe that that would happen other Uh than statistics. But you know, um, there was that fear of physical danger, um, just underlying all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, I just want to say, so I hear a lot about the idea that you were really focused on self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. like really being able to take care of yourself. And one of the things that I think is true about a lifetime, right, is that we're, we're almost being drawn through and towards, right, what we're trying to learn about our lifetimes. So when you said, I realize now that I was working very hard to get safe, um, you know, at some level that the more you did that, right, and the more you uh, supported yourself in doing that, the more it was going to move you really to whatever the next stage of your growth was or your lifetime was, whether it was conscious or not. Mm-hmm. And, and so to me, the question is that um, when I, when I talk to you about like your earlier days of growth, it seemed like you were intrigued by uh, what I want to say, smart thinking or uh, productive thinking or like intentional, like being intentional in life. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was part of the safety, Stephanie? Do you think that was part of that? Or do you think that was another aspect of you that actually started to emerge also about like wanting to have things happen? And, you know, when you said it's all about control, do you think that was more about the control side? Oh, no, I think that that was definitely my safety zone control side. Uh, Uh uh, Growing up, I was very socially anxious, even though that wasn't really anything that was spoken about when I was in elementary school age. Um, you know, shy maybe would have been a term, but um, I found that I could feel like I belonged if I was good at school. You know, mm-hmm. I, I could find success and a straight line to what felt like success in yep. academics or things like that, whereas social stuff didn't, you know, 
there was no straight line in social relationships. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think there is. That's the problem. They're so darn messy, right? Right, right, right. And so I, I couldn't, I think, understand what success looked like there. And because I was so shy or I have, I have really big emotions and really empathetic feelings. And so any form of emotional hurt felt like this huge deal. And so, I mean, that happens all the time, even in good relationships. And I think, um, I couldn't, I was not good at dealing with that. So I needed something that felt successful. Or, and something that felt sure, right. Is what Mm -hmm. I hear you describe, like that it was, it had not so much black and white, but it had clear, uh, pieces to it or elements to it, Mm -hmm. which, which is where I was going to go next. So what did you do with all your emotions? Did you just funnel them into this intention or did you find yourself like, how did you, did you end up ever going to therapy when you were younger? Like, what did you do there with the emotional side? Oh gosh. Um, no, I didn't go to therapy when I was younger. What did I do with the emotions? I think I turned it into drive ah. to toward what, you know, the linear, clear, successful line. I thought, um, and I mean, there was a lot of internal bad mouthing of my own self as well, but, uh, I would, I would turn my emotions into drive. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. Well, so yeah. this is, this is, I really appreciate how open you're being about your life and what you've been aware of. And one of the things I just want to say is, you know, I gave you, I, when I introduced you, I said, this is somebody who takes life by, you know, she holds on to it and makes it happen. And now we're kind of talking about, I think a little bit of the underbelly of that, which is that you have this amazing joie de vivre and passion for life. And then you also, because you have that, you could funnel the places that were more vulnerable, that were softer, right? The softer part, the emotions and the discomfort in terms of feeling like in those social spaces that were less, less definable, right? And that Mm -hmm. that also fueled into what your kind of natural state is, which is to seize life. And I, mm-hmm. I think that happens a lot for all of us is we have these uh, innate places in ourselves that are who we are. They're the essence of who we are. And then they also get utilized <laughs> to, to help us compensate for what we are not ready to handle or, or don't understand yet or are trying to take care of ourselves in some way. Does mm-hmm. that feel true, Stephanie, as I say it to you? I think so. I think so. You always have this way of putting words to things. <laughs> I couldn't possibly come up with on my own, but yeah. Yeah. Cut right to the source of it. Was there any other piece that you wanted to add to what I said? I, don't, I think it's really, I'm, I'm, I'm processing is my silence. And I, I think it's really interesting to think about the idea that that internal drive, you know, the joie de vivre that you spoke about is, you know, is innately there and is part of it. Um, but because it's there, it became where I funneled all of my, whatever you'd call it, extra turbulence from other areas as I was working out what I was growing through and what I was going to take out of those moments. And it, it funneled right into that spot. Yeah. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. I know in my particular case that I had, it's funny you're talking about tenaciousness. I had, I had a lot of my own drive uh, and, and, but I would say mine had an ability to be kind of uh, on the aggressive side. I think I've talked about it in a lot of the shows. And so what happened is when I was feeling un, unsafe or I was feeling vulnerable, I became more aggressive and mm-hmm. I became more dogmatic and I became more stubborn and I really couldn't hear anybody talk. Now I'm talking about right around between 25 to 30 ish or so, you know? And um, so it, it's, it was, it was, it took something to kind of like unwind that aspect. So then I could make room for these other aspects of myself, you know, and of course that marks my own growth process, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, so the challenge with all of this, right, is to not look back and make ourselves wrong. To mm-hmm. really, to really <laughs> celebrate, right, the amazing journey that we humans get on, 
that has a lot of like elbowing and, you know, getting big and getting small and moving to the left and falling over and then trying it again. And, you know, like to actually celebrate the adventure of that and to be able to see it through a different lens when we look back on it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's been one of the most beautiful parts that I've gained, you know, in my time knowing you is the ability to step back and look at it instead of be in the emotion of whatever, you know, like whatever it was looking back, um, nothing ever goes perfectly perfect all the time. Um, and just be curious about it. You know, I have this natural curiosity about things, but, um, this, we're kind of coming full circle, I feel like. So I have this curiosity, but, um, I hinted that something you said about the black and white and not being wrong making was something I struggled with as well. But I, I, that's all the internal. I'm very curious externally about all this stuff. But I, I think I've been very black and white about my own inner work until very recently and been able to turn that curiosity towards myself. Wow. Well, that was an awesome, awesome thing to say. I loved that, right? That you've been black and white with your internal world and are starting to be able to bring that like lighthearted and um, I don't want to say like the lifted version of curiosity into your own inner space, right? Mm -hmm. that's awesome so all right um we are right about ready we need to take a break and uh, when we come back we'll continue with our growth work conversation between stephanie and with me the best of the holistic spiritual and conscious world om times radio iom fm ascending hearts is no ordinary dating site but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. If I could be you, and you could be me, for just one hour, if you could find a way to get inside each other's mind, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome We've all felt left out, and for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. Okay, we're back. <laughs> I'm Sam Ferrato, and. I am having a great time chatting with Stephanie about growth work and transformation and her life. And um, so I just want to take a moment right now to everyone who's listening. Um, this is a good time if you just want to talk with Stephanie or have something to add to the conversation. This is a good moment to call in at 202-570-7057. And um, also, uh, Stephanie, you know, I want to just say, like, I thought about the last 30 minutes, it was kind of a whirlwind. And so we get to stop and everybody just take a breath. <laughs> and, and so I'm wondering, how are you doing over there? And are you uh, feeling comfortable with the conversation? And is there anything that you would like to add to it that I didn't ex explicitly ask up to this point? No, I think it's been great. It's just, a little, it's just feels like chatting with you over coffee. And I can't believe how fast time <laughs> flying. So not feeling good over here. Nothing to add. Okay. All right. Um, I do think um, that I, I, I've, I've noticed, I don't think I understood this when I, uh, even 10 years ago, but I, I really love getting to sit and talk about myself and then notice things and then think about oh, what that really mean and how that really go. But I also recognize lots of people 
it starts to feel very exposing for them. And I think we all hit those points, right, where we do actually feel exposed. So I do want to make sure you know that if I do ask a question that is too penetrating or is just not so comfortable, you just let me know and we'll we'll go in a different path. Yeah. Yeah, Got we're it. good. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so so we we hit this spot just before break where you were talking about that you've been so more black and white with yourself. What mm -hmm. like I feel like that's a super super common thing right? That people, and when they haven't actually started to go inside, that they manhandle themselves, and they shove themselves into pockets and path, you know, pathways. And, and so I, I was wondering, could you describe what that actually feels like when you manhandle yourself, mm -hmm. the, just for the audience? Mm -hmm. um, so it feels like a punch to the gut really so what I, my tendency to do is to oh you're the worst mm -hmm. just go straight oh you're the worst and just sink right into the shame or the regret or the whatever it is that I feel based off of usually having thought I disappointed somebody um or not mm -hmm. lived up to whatever expectation I had of myself um and it just, it's like a, like a adrenaline, but not a rush, like a wallop, you know, uh -huh. like, uh -huh. like a fear flight feeling yeah. where you're just like, ding, whomp, you know, and you're like, oh. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing because it's an awful feeling about the yeah. way you described it. I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think everybody has kind of a different experience of it. Mine, like the cells in my body, they start uh, racing around and I start feeling like my stomach is bottoming out. And all of a sudden I start feeling like I'm not on the ground. Like I like I like I lift and the lift is super uncomfortable. Hmm. And that, hmm. that's what I think is interesting. It's like, how do we mistreat ourselves or not care for ourselves or right you know give ourselves a hard time and there's always this sensory experience that goes with it right mm -hmm. yeah it's palpable yeah. yeah palpable right so um one of the things i really wanted to talk about because you're a, a mom of three amazing kids is um you know now that you are where you are at this moment in life what uh, self-development skills or what uh, self, you know, relationship skills, would you say are the most important ones that you try to provide for your children or would like them to have? Mm. Uh, awareness and I almost said respect, but acceptance of whatever they're feeling. Mm. Mm hmm. If to I could not make wish, themselves wrong. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. I could wish that they would not think I'm not supposed to feel that, you know, mm -hmm. and push it away or try to fix it or judge it or, you know, just this is how I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and let it, you know, not wallow, but let it be what it is. And then with enough acceptance so that they can see what it is, why it happened, what it meant to them, um, what they want to do about it. Because I think a lot of that making it wrong or hiding of those things um, really cuts off experience. You know, mm -hmm. you don't really let yourself learn about you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I, I I agree with you. It's great the way that you said that, because really, if you're going to cut off your emotional experience, then everything that lives underneath it is is buried for that time. Mm -hmm. Right. It's uh, it's overshadowed uh, by the the block that you've put in place. Now, do you find it hard as a mom to let that happen? <laughs> because I I think we think it's important, but I don't know that it's so easy sometimes to let everybody have their feelings. Yeah, I, I find it hard, mostly, so I have the three kids, like you said, so I find it really challenging when other, my, my other kids are, if it's not, if it's just me and one child, uh -huh. I 
be there with them and allow it to happen, whatever it is, you know, um, like, for example, sadness. I think most parents have experienced their child crying and us trying to make them not cry, right? <laughs> because <laughs> we don't like what it's happening um, emotionally or, like, it's too loud and we're, like, trying to get somewhere or we're embarrassed because it's, like, in the theater or whatever, you know, whatever the reason is. Uh, we don't want them to cry. <laughs> so you're fine <laughs> crying. And um, for me, when my kids are all very sensitive to each other's emotions as well. And so it's extra much. Like I don't want the one child to be crying, but I also don't want the other children to be sad about crying. And so I feel very urgently like I need to manage emotions oh, yeah, when they're all yeah, around yeah. Yeah. versus experience it with them or let them experience it however they need to experience it or whatever. Um but if I'm just, if it's just me and them and there are no other parties present, then it's easier for me to kind of make the space for it, if that makes sense. Oh, it does make sense. I, I will tell you, I had this image of uh, being on a boat when one person throws up and then everybody else starts throwing up. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so that's where my initial head went. But I, I, I don't think I ever thought about it in this space because I could get being super concerned that my like the first child that's sad it has the experience the second child that gets sad that they they have the potential of getting overwhelmed with their sadness and then they start not wanting to feel like I could picture a lot of managing going on trying to make sure that it's all stable you know there's a stabilizing quality to it yeah but then I get to the tail end of it and I'm like all my all my kids watched me do was shut down feelings all of them yeah <laughs> I didn't teach the ones that weren't crying how to help yeah. somebody else feeling, you know, how to react to somebody who's feeling emotions in a welcoming way. And I didn't help the one that was feeling the emotions feel like they could feel the emotions. <laughs> <It just> be- <laughs> well, I, and this is why uh, being a parent is just so darn hard, <laughs> right? Because we really, we really have to give ourselves a break in there. Because to me, just that you notice all of that and you notice, you know, that you start to get afraid and you're trying to manage it that that actually is awareness right and at the end of the day we can always return to it and as a parent you can come back and say to your kids hey i get nervous too when there's a lot of feeling and i'm afraid i'm not going to manage it well you know mm-hmm. and so it, i if it, it's interesting when you said that one of the uh, the skills or uh, qualities you want them to have is awareness you're actually demonstrating it in the way that you're talking about it mm. Yeah. See, I think, I think we, uh, I think we have a tendency to look at the result, which is, did I do it well? And I can check it off and give myself an A. When in truth, what matters most is that our hearts are open to to not knowing and then being aware of how it goes, and that's what you just described. Mm. So. Is there a, another thought that's coming when you think about uh, being a mom and uh, trying to create an environment where your kids are learning how to stay in relationship with their whole selves? Uh, well, it's interesting because, I mean, every age is different, um, but our oldest is double digits now and the age where I really remember myself feeling like, I'm not a little kid anymore. I'm a bigger kid. Mm. And um, it, it, it kind of flip flopping the question because I'm really seeing him become more aware of like, be curious about who he wants to be in different situations. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also a really big time for us to be, we're redefining our relationship as well. He and mm-hmm. I are. Um mm-hmm. And it's because he's being aware that he wants to be different in different situations. And so it's been really interesting to go on that journey with him because he's obviously like massive growth and has all these internal thoughts and feelings that I'm unaware of. Um, It's just his own journey. Right. But I am on a journey with him as his mother. And so um, I think going back to the question of like what self-development skills, um, being able to be okay with the unknown, I think mm-hmm. would be another one mm-hmm. instead of mm-hmm. always needing to know and always having it definite and being uncomfortable with 
gray area or newness or unknown because so much of life is that um and he's pretty like sometimes he says these things and it's like oh my gosh you're so amazingly aware of yourself in ways that I have (laughs) it took me (laughs) almost 40 years to figure out um (laughs) but uh you know but then there are other moments where I see him like struggle or at least outwardly seems like he's struggling in ways that I did you know and so um yeah it's just I suppose being okay with the unknown and being like you know what I don't know why I'm feeling this I'm just feeling it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll figure it out later (laughs) Well, and, and it, is, it really takes something, right? When you're in those moments and you're, you're, your child's talking to actually, even though you think you might have a sense of what's going on, to say, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure yet. What do you think it is? I just think that's the hardest moment to give it over to, the, to you know, a young person or someone else. Because I really, I like knowing stuff. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Even if I don't really know it, I can put together a really good package of something. <laughs> you know? uh-huh. Yep. And with kiddos, I want to know exactly what happened and why they're feeling the thing, what they're thinking. And uh, it took me, I learned it a few years back, but it took me a while to realize that that was not what they needed in that moment. Hmm. They just needed to be feeling whatever they were feeling. They couldn't answer my questions because they didn't know. Um, interesting now, all the things I want them to learn are the things I'm still learning, right? <laughs> well, I think that's is actually how it goes, don't you think? Mm-hmm. I, what I am struck by is that back with this uh, food is love is that all that unknown that we're talking about, there is just something about when you can sit at a table and eat uh, food, you know, that has love wrapped around it. I think it helps to soften all the unknown because we human beings are living with so much of it. I think we're spending all of our time trying not to. And so it dawns on me that food is one of those places and, and music, right? When music is in the background, there's this sense of I'm okay. You know, there's something going on around me that makes me feel comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, so, all right. I would love to switch gears. Are you okay if we go in a different direction? Let's do it. Okay. Well, so I feel like, uh, People in your age group, you, you mentioned 40 years, uh, in, and that have young children and are trying to make it, make it all work and everything. And I think about women and how they're uh, challenged all the time with trying to be everything to everybody. And so I'm curious, in your opinion, what you think the biggest challenge for women in your age group, and it can be men too, but what, what do you think is really the hardest thing to manage? at that at your point in life oh my I might have to think about this what's the hardest thing to manage in my life in this age group because you have you know friends I'm thinking that you talk to all the time and yeah yeah I <laughs> yeah. think <laughs> yeah <laughs> mostly I'm a recluse but I have a couple I think the hardest thing is to know yourself because we're in the throes of career building and we're in the throes of family building and we're at this point where we're not, I'm going to say new and young, you know, but we're, we're established, but we're not, I don't know, com- settled yet, I would say maybe in every part of life, like, you know, established, but not I know exactly what I'm doing, which is probably hilarious because we maybe we'll never feel like that. Uh, but there's this <laughs> idea that eventually oh, I know exactly what I'm doing is going to be right around the corner. Um, but I think <laughs> the biggest thing that uh, I think women my age and I have conversations with with a lot of the people I know is um, what do I want? Mm. You know, what is it that I want? Mm-hmm. Because there's all these things we've built that we want, wanted and want, you know, but it's like, well, who, who am I inside? What am I doing to, I don't know, if you're not in a creative field, feel creative or to still explore or um, really live life because so we're so think, busy living life. That, well, that's my question. <laughs> do you think you get caught up in all the roles that there's a place where it's hard to stay in touch with what really uh, feeds this your soul and feeds the essence of you because all of a sudden the roles 
start to consume you. Yeah. Yeah. And even if, if we took the time, cause there's no, that's the thing, right? It's like there's our, our time is so packed and spent with these things that we chose, you know, but there's no time to sit and, well, how am I feeling about that? Is it still what I want? Is, is it, you know, am I getting what I want out of it? And so even if we took the time and it ended up that food, for example, you know, like I am eating food every day, but maybe it's not the food I want, you know, or maybe just a little sauce or maybe just five more minutes at the dinner table. So I didn't have to snarf it down before soccer practice. I could actually taste what I was eating. Um, like maybe it's all really there, <laughs> but we're not taking the chance to be mindful about it, to feel the joy that is within it that we really could be gleaning. Uh-huh. Um, so. You know what I'm struck by is that, uh, you know, when I think about, you know, a long time ago, we, we didn't have all these things that made our life move at such a rapid pace, you know, whether it was phones and computers and texting and all that stuff. But what happened to me when I think about that is that the time wasn't also filled with um, intimacy building, relational, emotional material either. At, when we had when we had the time, and, and now we're living this life at this pace that's just incredible, right? And now we're trying to create space also to drop deeper in ourselves and to stay connected to our whole self and to know what what's going on for us. It it doesn't quite seem like it it matches up. It seems like the other thing should have been done, you know, when we had the time to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think that means? Like, like in terms of if you think about the human race, I'm going to go really broad here, the human race and our progression and our evolution through time, like, what do you think it's going to hit a wall? And then there, there's going to be all this conscious choice about how we don't want to go that fast or like what do you think is going to happen Stephanie Mm -hmm. I think there's already movement towards slowness and slowing down at least the desire of the ideas that however successful these movements are um, like slow back to food right like the slow food versus fast food and um back to homesteading or back to, you know, um, balance. And like, I think the idea of us wanting that is already there. Um, and I think that we, it might be because there's less time for it or, you know, it's kind of that once you lose the ability to have something, you realize how much you wanted it, even though you didn't take advantage of it when you had the time, mm-hmm. um, because we're so busy and, so stretched and so scheduled, it might be that we need it more. We need it more. Hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was reading an article today about that they've done a bunch of studies and that the single most important thing someone can do to help their children be successful in life is to read to them. Mm. And I, I thought about that because doesn't it? It makes so much sense. It's two people being together, exchanging words. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and really, you could take that and say, oh, they've not done a study yet on being with our children and talking about feelings yet. <laughs> right. Or ta- talking about. Right. But if you think about it in the past, the reading to somebody actually did that. Mm-hmm. Right. It created this being with time. Right. Yeah. Well, I do think a lot of stories allow you to explore emotion without it feeling so direct. You know, so oh, that's it, true. It, Yeah. So instead of how are you handling this emotion, let's talk about your very zingy emotion that's still currently happening inside of your little baby heart. Um, (laughs) Let's talk about this elephant on the page who is feeling this emotion and that feels more approachable potentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Well, so I have, I have just a kind of a wild question. If you were, I, I'm always drawn to these uh, groups and the people who are leading them that talk about, you know, really letting all, shaking off all the kind of confines of being in your body and being wild, wild and free and just letting it go and having no sense of worrying about what you look like or what you sound like. Where would that happen for you? Like what part of the world or what would you be doing 
or at what t- time of day, like where would you shake it all off and be a wild woman? Oh, gosh. I instantly thought about water. Mm. Someplace with water, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what's the water doing? Like, are you skinny dipping or like, what's wild about it? Just that you could do whatever. I mean, I think it's, I think the water has always been a big part of my life and the lure, um, but it's, it's not fast moving. It's, you know, there's some waves or whatever, but it's really like you could, you could swim down underneath. You can float on top. You could splash. You could be in it. You oh. could be out of it. I think just all and, the and, various ways to be with the water, you know, right. And the water kind of holds you in the space, so you don't have to worry about holding yourself up. Uh huh. Yeah, it's right? playful. I don't know if you've seen Moana, but the grandmother in that uh, sings a song, and she some of the lyrics. I'm going to get them a little bit wrong, but it's um, I like the water. I like how she misbehaves. You know, so it's kind of like water has its own personality, and it surely does because I was a lifeguard for a while, so I experienced that personality a couple times. But um you know, it has its own mind, but there you are with it. Yeah. Having your mind too. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting because I grew up around a lot of water too, but I had a very, very like mostly was always under it. So I had, I could hold my breath a really long time. Mm -hmm. I like swimming under it. The swimming on top of it was a lot less fun to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and it so fits my personality, right? I like to swim under things. And, you know, I like to go yeah. down under and look up and see what I uh-huh. see. Um, and the thing that was so interesting, though, is that the water felt like the way you described food to me, that mm-hmm. I felt safe in the water. And I know people have had a lot of experiences where they don't feel safe. But to me, if I was in the water, I felt held and supported. And so it really... It, and I know they talk about it, like what it does for your brain waves when you're in the water a lot. I think mm-hmm. it definitely did do that for me as well. Is that where you would be a wild woman? Uh, no, I have to just say I pictured myself uh, dancing nude <laughs> under the moon with a big fire and um, like lots of drums. <laughs> That's really uh, where I like- <laughs> Um, I do think I would I, I would be too chicken to do this, but it would be if I were really being wild, it would be to dive off of a two or three story waterfall and dive into like a big pool. I think that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, Stephanie, we are about almost out of time. Is there anything else that, it, you know, came up for you while we were talking or you just would like to share about your own growth process and your journey um, with the people that have been getting to know you in the last hour. Oh my gosh. I'm going to share that I'm feeling pressure right now to somehow get an A plus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny, but I get it. Although I just found that hour delightful. I even feel like I got to know you in a new way and a better, you know, like new pieces came out. So for me, I just super, super enjoyed your, you know, engaging with you about it all. No, I, I feel the same. Every time I speak with you, it's um, something new comes up. And I think that's, I think that's one of the biggest things is, um, I mean, I've had this growth experience a, a lot because of you. I'll just say that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, there's some internal stuff that happens, but what happens when you share that with somebody, like this conversation that we had, um there's places I wouldn't have gone if you didn't prompt a question or I didn't have to answer out loud, not have to, but you know, I it wasn't an ex- experience where I would be answering out loud. And um, so I found, I, I not learned new things, but I experienced things I haven't thought about in a long time as well. So thank you for letting me be on here and have that experience with you. Oh, well, that's, that's so awesome that you, that you uh, got to explore yourself in a different way because of the way we were talking about it. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, you know, I wanted to say I delight when people do uh, lyrics from from music. 
I never remember the lyrics and I have people around me and you just did it. I just want you to know, I always feel like, oh, that is such a great contribution to this moment, you know? So I just (laughs) want to say, uh, uh, you know, like it was all delightful. But when you did that, I thought, oh, that is the cherry on the cake here talking about wedding cake. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. When I'm with clients, I write, they'll do a quote like that and I'll write it down really quick. And then I think, oh, I got to go look up that song. You know, I never remember yeah. the lyrics. So I I don't know why I try to write it down because it goes in one ear and out the other, but it delights me on its way through, you know. I will send you this song. It's It's good. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, thank you for taking an hour out of your family time to be with us tonight. I really appreciate it so much. And thank you for being in my life as well. Oh, thank you. It is absolutely my pleasure. Mm. All right. Well, I think we're ending a few minutes early or half a minute early. No, I were pretty good. All right. Good night, Stephanie. Good night, everyone. <laughs> good night. <laughs>